how far would you go for the health and well-being of your child? The answer? As far as your heart will take you. This past summer, I attempted to break the trans-Canadian speed record by running all the way from Victoria, B.C. to St. John's, Newfoundland in just 66 days. That's 7,200 kilometers, 108 kilometers of running per day, 10,000 daily calories, and 16 pairs of shoes. Why? Well, that's simple. My 10-year-old boy, Sam. You see, Sam has a rare disease called relapsing encephalopathy with cerebellar ataxia. We call it RECA. And it took us over six years to get that diagnosis. And I'll tell you one thing. Six years spent in a diagnostic odyssey for any family going without proper care, hope, answers, and potential proper treatment is way too long. Sam struggles with most daily basic motor functions, leaving him unbalanced and uncoordinated with daily activities, such as getting dressed, walking, and feeding himself. It's not lost on me, the fact that my limits seem boundless, yet my son is limited by a predetermined genetic ceiling. There's very little that our governments and our medical system can do for us rare families in Canada most of the time leaving us with limited support, access, and research. Canada is the only developed country in the world without a rare disease strategy. And my, my fear is that my son's needs will not be met. I know that if Canadians only knew of this void within their system, they would do something about it. So on June 27th, 2018, I took my first step in Victoria and ran east. Now, the furthest that I've ever run prior to this transgender run was six days. But to put this into context, I hold numerous Canadian and world running records, such as the world record for the furthest distance run on a treadmill in 24 hours, that was 260.4 kilometers. I hold the Canadian 24, 48, and 72-hour records. And just three weeks ago, like Tim mentioned, I broke the world record here in Calgary by running uh, 100 miles in a world record time of 12 hours and 32 minutes. But, oh, but this multi-week running thing was new to me. And friends of mine who have done things like this in the past have told me, Dave, whatever you do, don't drop out in the first week. It gets better. Day one, anxiety drove a stake through my heart. Day two, my legs started failing. Doubt set in on day three, somewhere running up the Coquihalla Highway. Day four, extreme sleep deprivation. Day five, I awoke with tendonitis and half the muscles in my legs. And on day six, I lied there in my RV and I thought, if this is how I'm feeling on day six, how on earth is it humanly possible to run another 60? All this time, our Little Outrun Rare campaign to raise funds and awareness for the Rare Disease Foundation was getting huge national media interest. Fundraising was going extremely well. But most importantly, we sparked a conversation amongst average Canadians about rare disease. On day seven, somewhere running up Rogers Pass, my legs started to feel better. Leg pain lessened, started getting better night sleeps, and coincidentally, my pace started to pick up as I sloped out from the Canadian Rockies and into Calgary on day 11. Now, during my overnight in Calgary, I stopped in at the Foothills Hospital for a planned cardiovascular MRI. Now, this was a part of a study that Dr. James White and his team were doing to better understand the effects of such a huge endurance activity and the physical demands on the cardiovascular tissues and its functions. Now, understand that this was the large, one of the largest cardiovascular endurance studies ever done. Dr. James White and his team were chomping at the bit to capture this data. 
Now, to put this into perspective, the average stroke volume range for an average male is four to eight liters of blood per minute at rest. So what that means is that the average male will pump out four to eight liters of blood out to their body to perform its normal functions. When I started running across the country, I had an MRI taken, and it showed that my right ventricle was pumping out 8.2 liters of blood per minute at rest, and my left ventricle was pumping out 7.4 liters of blood per minute at rest. And what that means is that I could moderately exercise for three to four hours, and I would be relatively comfortable because I'm fit. When I exited the MRI machine, the cardiologists, they had a smile on their face because they saw something truly miraculous. In the span of only 11 days, my stroke volume increased from 8.2 liters from my right ventricle and 7.4 liters from my left ventricle to an absolutely astounding 14.4 liters from my right ventricle and 12.2 liters from my left ventricle. That is well... Oh. That is well over twice the average male's stroke volume. As you can clearly see here in the circle cardiovascular 4D images, just the extreme difference in just 11 days. The vivid colors shown in, in these images show the speed and the volume of the blood flow as it travels through my heart. The first column was an MRI taken two months before I started running across the country. Now, I was fit when this MRI was taken, and you could see just the amount of blood flow going through my heart. The second column was an MRI taken only a couple days before I started running across the country. That's our baseline. That's the 8.2 liters from the right ventricle and the 7.4 liters from the left ventricle. The third column, that's where the fireworks take place. And you can see the significant difference between the third column and the second column. That's where the 14.4 and the 12.2 liters per minute are. The, the fourth column is a very interesting column, and you'll see a return to normalcy. That was an MRI that was taken two months after I stopped running. What you'll see here is that looks an awful lot like the first column, because when I didn't need to run across the country over 100 kilometers a day, day in and day out for weeks on end, there was a return to normalcy. My body adapted back to normal when you didn't need to do something really hard every day. My body was changing. The same way that Sam adapts to the struggles in his environment. Every day, I watch him growing and changing to better find solutions to a world unkind to people with disabilities. Dr. White's findings leave more questions than they do answers. And most of these questions circle around the human adaptive modeling theories that have been presented the past many years. Science is continually uncovering what the human body can do in extreme conditions. And I personally know that what science has uncovered we, as humans, can do way more. We've engineered an extremely soft existence for ourselves in this first world, and it can't but not define our new normal. What is hard? What is painful? What is challenging and what is difficult? All the while, while walking through a grocery store with 20,000 food items that you did not need to hunt, gather, grow, or prepare. The fact that we don't need to struggle is a beautiful thing. And I, I don't begrudge anyone for ever choosing comfort. But we must remember the building blocks in our DNA that saw us through wars, famine, and the struggle of yesteryear are just waiting to ignite. I continued running across the Canadian prairies every day logging 100, 105, 110 kilometers a day, mowing down the Canadian speed record day by day. I got to the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border, and I suffered an injury to a disc in my lower back. And when I got to the east side of Winnipeg, I was forced to stop. 
That was a hard day. I believe in the human adaptive model. Science will continually uncover what is physiologically possible. But a big, big part of me knows that my incredible stroke volume increase was a direct result of the love for that I have for my son, Sam. The love one holds in their heart for their child cannot be measured or calculated, but rather described as boundless. I personally know that we humans can and we do adapt to meet the struggles in front of us. Life and love make us explorers of our limits. For whom and how far would you go to discover your limits? <laughs>